Okay, welcome y'all uh, to who gets to vote. And with that, I want to hand it off to Professor Lo Faber. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And uh, I also want to introduce you, since you only appear as New Orleans <laughs> Public Library. Uh, but Joyce just asked in the chat who is the facilitator for the library. So that is Amanda Fallis. My bad. I am Amanda Fallis. I am an archivist at the City Archives at the New Orleans Public Library. And um, I uh, really, this is all low in LEH. And I'm grateful to them for allowing us to present it to y'all and to be able to get the books that we were able to share. Um, if you weren't able to get a free book, no worries. I'm not sure how many I have left. But um, if you didn't, we also have them available for requests through the library catalog too, if you want to read them. Yeah. Uh, well, well, thanks, Amanda. And I just want to start off by saying how happy I am to be doing this. And it's really a, uh, an honor to be asked to do it uh, by the library. And it's so great that there are, let's see, 15 people here right now. Uh, and I hope everyone knows this is the first of four sessions uh, that are going to cover various aspects of voting rights and the history of voting rights. And each session is keyed to a particular book. So the book, as Amanda already mentioned, the book, the first book, the book uh, we're talking about today is Alan Lickman's The Embattled Vote in America, which is a huge survey spanning the entire sweep of American history from the revolutionary period to the very recent past uh, and covering the, the very checkered history of voting rights uh, through all the different historical periods. The second book for next week, a week from today, is Martha Jones's uh, Vanguard, which is about Black women and their uh, not just uh, uh, voting, but all the forms that of political activism uh, again, spanning the whole history of the United States from the rev revolutionary period to the very recent past. And in week three, uh, we'll be reading Carol Anderson's One Person, No Vote, which really uh, does take it up uh, to more recent developments in a, a closer look uh, at voting and voter suppression and democracy in the United States, really uh, since the Bush-Gore election in 2000, and even more so uh, since the Shelby Holder decision of 2013. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that quite a bit throughout the series. And finally, in session four, we have uh, Locked Out by Jeff Manza and Christopher Ogan, which is about uh, the topic of uh, felony disenfranchisement since there are uh, an estimated over 5 million American citizens who uh, cannot vote because of current or former felony convictions. Uh, and I believe that we're going to have some special guests at that session uh, who are active in, in uh, this field right now to bring us up to date on very current developments in uh, felony disenfranchisement and voting rights. So uh, I just wanted to start off by saying, and, and the bulk of this will really be discussion and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what everyone has to say, particularly if you have read the Lichtman book. Uh, we've opened this discussion up to, to anyone, whether they have read the book or not, but I can tell you that as a, uh, from my experience as a college professor, the discussions go better uh, when, when people have done the reading. Um, and when, when we planned this series, uh, when Amanda and the library and the LEH uh, were putting this together, we could not have imagined uh, how timely it would be. Uh, and both because of the, the election, the presidential election and the aftermath of the presidential election uh, and because of things that are happening right now, both at the state and federal level, uh, the, this we, we are in the midst of really a national debate and discussion uh, about voting rights and about how our democracy should work. Uh, 
So, and that being said, I have to also say as a historian, uh, I'm very committed to the idea that, you know, we study history uh, to ultimately, of course, to understand the present and to have context to understand the present. Uh, but if we, uh, we ha you have to approach history, you know, on it, on its own terms. Uh, if, if you are interested in the history purely from a perspective of arguing about the present, it might distort uh, your understanding of the past and, and uh, cause you to be somewhat less than objective in how you approach the history. Uh, so with all that being said, uh, I, I think we're ready to start a discussion here. Yeah, um, I just want to step in one more time. And again, I want to tell everybody it's it's you're welcome to type in chat. You're welcome to uh, unmute and uh, or raise your hand and then, you know, I'll call on you and you can um, offer your comment. But um, maybe to get the discussion started, we could just follow the discussion guide if that's OK. Um, what we'll do is sort of ask questions and we would love it if you guys would either type in chat or raise your hand and we can have you speak out loud. Any anything you want to add to um, each discussion question? Does that sound good to you, Lo? It sounds great to me, uh, and I I I actually wrote the discussion guide uh, for the Lichtman book. I I different scholars wrote the discussion guides for the other three books, uh, but I wrote this one, so I'm pretty familiar with it. <laughs> and you want me to read the questions to um, give you a little bit of um, vocal rest in between, and then you can step in, and then everybody else can step in with their responses. Should we do that? I actually wanted to read a quotation from the book. Yes. Uh, that I that I that caught my eye just this morning as I was sort of reviewing some of the book, and uh, this is a this is a quote from 1990, so 31 years ago. And at that time, there was a debate going on in Congress about a piece of legislation called the Motor Voter Act, which automatically registered citizens across the United States when they applied for a driver's license or to renew a driver's license, uh, hence the term Motor Voter Act. And that bill passed in Congress, but then was vetoed by George H.W. Bush. Uh, and then in 1993, it passed in Congress again, and it was signed into law by Bill Clinton. Uh, but during the debates in 1990 in Congress, uh, someone said this, quote, relatively low voter turnout is a sign of a relatively content democracy. Who said that in 1990? It was Mitch McConnell, Senator from Kentucky. <laughs> so uh, fast forward to today and, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell is a very powerful senator and minority leader is conducting the exact same uh, side of the argument. Uh, so it, it brings us to the first uh, discussion question that I wrote for the Lichtman book. And, and uh, I'll just go ahead and read it, Amanda. Uh, it's, it's striking that many of the debates over voting and democracy sound the same today as they did in the 1790s, uh, even as our nation and society have changed in countless profound ways. So uh, one thing historians like to do is contrast continuity with change. You know, what's changed? What's stayed the same? Uh, in your reading of this book, or, you know, if you haven't read the book, just in, in your opinion, in your experience, what has changed and what has remained the same about voting rights in, in the United States over the last 230 years? Uh, and do you think more has, more has changed or more has stayed the same? And I don't know if anyone wants to, you, you can respond uh, in the chat, but we, we hope that you would respond uh, in the video. Yeah, 
Is anyone feeling brave enough to, to comment <laughs> on that today? We have folks typing. Yes, Rel, thank you. If you if you want to uh, hop in, welcome. Hello. Oh, and give a quick introduction as well. I am Rel Farrar, and I work at New Orleans Public Library. But nothing I say is a representation of that organization. <laughs> um, and I work in the acquisitions department and I am the person that buys the books for adults for the library. Great. Um, yeah, I guess um, what I thought about in answer to your question, it's not a very good answer. That's why I like <laughs> hesitated. But I guess I was thinking about how we could take any of the arguments against voting rights, all of these uh, historical arguments that are made. I guess I was just thinking like, there, those are all just lie, disingenuous lies <laughs> that, um, that we are arguing against to try to reason with these people that aren't actually interested in making a reasoned argument, they're, they're just interested in disenfranchising people. And so anything that they say, uh, we shouldn't take it at face value, I guess, was kind of what I was thinking about. It's not a very good answer to your question and I apologize for <laughs> it, but no one else was saying anything, I thought I'd, contribute. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate, first of all, I really appreciate you being here. And second of all, I really appreciate you being the first to jump in uh, with, a, with, a, with a question. And really, I hope that everybody will follow Rel's lead. And, and uh, you can, of course, uh, type questions in, in and comments in the chat as well. But it's, it's really, I mean, part of the reason we're doing a discussion is it's, it's different to be able to hear someone say something. And I, I think you're your question or your answer to my question was wonderful. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's a bad answer. <laughs> and, you know, it's a discussion, so there are no bad answers. But uh, what I interpret you saying is that the anti voting arguments or the anti democratic arguments are not being made in good faith. And I, I see that uh, Emily has also typed that in the chat. I saw Emily's uh, summary of it and I was like, yes, that is what I'm saying. And we engage with them as if it's in good faith when it's not. Right. Yes. Thank you, Emily. And thank you. <laughs> uh, in the first chapter of the Lichtman book, which is actually the, the covers the revolutionary period in the constitution, which happens to be the part that I know the most about because my scholarly background is actually in, in early American history. He quotes John Adams making the argument against really democracy. I mean, the framers of the constitution were not, would not have called themselves Democrats or being, they would not have said they favored democracy. They equated democracy with mob rule was a phrase that they would use. Uh, and so they favored voting, but only for uh, a, a select small portion of the population that was not only white and male, but also, uh, you know, possessed a certain amount of property. They were heads of household and they were, they, these were the people that John Adams felt were, were worthy to cast votes. And, and so John Adams was expressing a very common uh, philosophical objection to mass democracy. But what you're saying, and I, I think I agree, is that that's not what's happening with these arguments now. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to invite uh, Celine, I hope I got that right, to speak next. Great. Uh, th this is actually Jim. I'm Celine's husband, and she is kindly permitting me to speak. Um, the, uh, I, I agree that a lot of arguments against uh, expansion of voting rights are made 
in, in bad, bad faith. Um, I do think from a historical standpoint, my background is uh, way, way, way back and it was history. Um, but if you look at democracy as it arose through the ages and you go back to the Greek model of democracy, it was similar to what you described, um, Professor, as the early American John Adams commentary. It was not a, it was not intended or was not designed and did not have representation of all residents. It, I think, philosophically rested on the premise that you had people with enough leisure time to investigate the issues presented to society and try to come up with a rational, and I use that term guardedly, uh, rational analysis of pros and cons and fully be able to discuss those pros and cons as part of the democratic body sure. driving where society was going. I think one of the challenges I find today is if you question, and I'm sure everyone at the library has found this, if you ask people about when was the Civil War or when did the revolution happen or who, you know, there's a genuine lack of basic common knowledge of where the country has been and how it got to where it is that probably should be part of any discussion about how to move forward into the future. And if the people making those decisions don't have that grounding, then are the decisions being made um, taken with, with full understanding of the import. There's certainly, I, I get the idea that at this point, there are so many people that sort of, it just by the mass numbers, it may work out as compared to say revolutionary or early American or going back to Greco-Roman times where the populations were smaller. But I do think it's something for people to keep in mind about how do you have an informed citizenry to make these very important decisions when you have the people electing those having little to, to in some cases, no understanding of how the history of the country or society. With that, thank you for the time. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jim, uh, for that and for being here. And thanks to Soline also for sharing <laughs> your connection with Jim. And uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Jim, about, I, I think you encapsulated very well the classical view of democracy that existed, you know, among elite white Americans at the time of the founding. Uh, they by, by no means would they uh, contemplate, you know, the idea of universal suffrage. And as Lichtman point out, points out, they did not uh, put in our constitution a fundamental right to vote. Uh, they did not consider that, you know, we have all sorts of rights guaranteed in the constitution. You know, we have the right to bear arms. We have the right to not have soldiers quartered in our houses, which doesn't come into play that often uh, these days, but we don't have a fundamental right uh, to vote. Uh, but, and, and so there's some tension there because obviously a lot of people now do share a view of democracy that is more uh, oriented around the idea that yes, all, all, uh, all human beings, or at least all adult human beings, uh, should have an equal right to participate. And I also wanted to really highlight what you said about the lack of civics education. And uh, Danielle Allen, who is a scholar at Harvard, who just wrote a great book about the Declaration of Independence. And in the links that we shared in the chat, uh, she is also behind uh, the Our Common Purpose report uh, with their 31 recommendations for renewing American democracy, which I really recommend reading. It's a very interesting and inspiring document. Uh, but on her, uh, aside from the, the democracy thing, her other big uh, cause is actually uh, renewing civics education in American schools. Uh, 
And so there, there's a big push for that because, you know, it, it used to be something that was taught in schools and for a variety of reasons that kind of stopped uh, in the, I guess, 1980s and, and 90s. Uh, and so people are, people are making the same argument as you and trying to bring that back. So Amanda, do we have any, anyone else? Uh, um, I wanted to invite Emily to speak, uh, just a short introduction and then uh, your comment. Um, I'm Emily. I also work at the library. Um, but of course, my my comments today don't reflect that. I think um, that we're just, you know, it doesn't, I don't represent the library in what I'm about to say. But um, I have a couple of thoughts um, to Celine's partner. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch your first name. But there's a couple of things that I my brain was just kind of exploding because I've been thinking and talking to a lot of people about civics and about voting in the last couple of years. Um, and one of the things I've realized is like, as someone who hustled most of my life, like to make rent, you know, to like, I had to put together a bunch of part-time jobs, um, before I worked at the library, that was like the first like professional job I had with benefits and all of that. I didn't have time and I couldn't get like approval to go and do civically engaged things. Um, and so this is this is by design, this isn't an accident, you know, like we wanna keep the people that we don't want voting so busy just feeding themselves that that they don't have time to investigate who to vote for or, 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 or they don't have time to go vote, you know, because even though we're supposed to be able to vote, you know, um, anyways, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure everyone here knows what I know. But then it also goes back to education, as we say, like, there's been a disinvestment from civics and also rhetoric education in the last like, what, 20, 25, 30 years, or even longer than that. So that a lot of people don't know how to investigate the rhetoric of marketing. Um, you know, like, they don't understand how to debate. You know, I find myself getting very, very frustrated sometimes and, and struggling to actually just debate unemotionally because for I think for a lot of us politics is personal in the sense that it affects our personal lives but then there's people who are trained in rhetoric still who are politicians this is or I think lawyers still learn how to do this in law school um, so I think it goes back to the fact that um, as revolutionary as our founding fathers were like they they had blind spots and that happens anytime you have only a certain kind of person in the room you're gonna have blind spots that other people might be able to point out because they have different experiences. And they weren't, I think I think looking back, I look back on it and I'm just like, maybe they weren't capable of being fully revolutionary and seeing the things that they didn't see. But there's just part of me that's just like, how could they not see, <laughs> you know? Like this has to have been by design because they didn't trust, you know, the rabble to think. They didn't trust the rabble to educate themselves or be educated. Um, so it's like the self, uh, anyways, I'm just rambling now, but those are my thoughts um, to uh, Celine's partner's uh, points. Excellent. Uh, and to the book too, also. I'm sorry? Oh, and also like my brain was thinking about those. Oh, I was going to say about civic education. I grew up in Georgia until I was 16. And I just recently interviewed a friend of mine that went to school with me, um, same age. And I was like, and we were talking about our civics education. And we realized that growing up just north of Atlanta, we weren't really taught that the South didn't win the Civil War. <laughs> you know, like it, it wasn't explicitly said. And so I feel like our... Um, Oh, sorry about that, Celine Jim. Thank you for your points. Um, uh, we weren't really explicitly taught sort of the truth when it came to civic education because, you know, uh, we were taught sort of like the belief of the place. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I grew up in New Jersey. So, uh, you know, we were taught in school that the North one. Uh, <laughs> I've lived in New Orleans uh, for, for a decade now. And, and yeah, I've realized that uh, the people who grew up in the, in the South, in many cases, had a very different uh, education, not just about the Civil War, but about many things. Um, and so, uh, uh, Emily, thank you for all that. And uh, can I just also say it's entirely up to everyone but I'd love for you to show your video when, at least when you ask a question, 
uh, because it's great to, to see you. And uh, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm just a visual person and I'd like to be able to see the, the person talking if that's possible. Uh, but if you don't wanna, that's entirely fine as well. So I think what Emily's uh, remarks and Jim's remarks also point us to the discussion question number three, Amanda, which is specifically about education and how we learned about this in school. So maybe maybe we should go to that. Sorry, I have mics off. Yeah, that sounds good to me as well. Um, uh, Rel, did you were you able to get your comment into chat as well? I actually was going to talk about the civics and education thing anyway. Um, I mean, I did get a civics education and what I was taught in that civics education, I've really had to re-examine and learn uh, was a very bad representation. It, it was a fine representation for America, but when you go outside of America, you realize that you've only been taught a very narrow, limited field about civics. You know, there's the Democrats and the Republicans, and that's the spectrum of the <laughs> of the politics. And um, you know, America has two political parties, and they're both conservative. And you don't really get that perspective. You're America is never going to teach you no civics class in America that they're going to do is going to be like, and here's the Zapatistas. <laughs> they're wildly different than the politics we have over here. I don't know, like, yes, I, I, I do think people, you know, this is a big thing in the library world right now. There's a big conversation being had, many of you probably already know, about the fact that the um the the you can't just teach people critical thinking there's a whole movement of people nowadays that say um do the research uh as a like flat earth is real do the research because right. you can go on the internet and find 15 sources that say the earth is flat and they're and they and then they're like do the research mm -hmm. There's no way to argue against this. I mean, those people are, they've been taught critical thinking. They've been, unfortunately, like, but a partial lie can be more uh, problematic than, you know, a, a full fledged lie. And there's so many issues here. Anyway, that was my comment. Uh. Well, thanks, Rel, and and I think uh, your point is well taken about uh, civics education and how it is, you know, very confined to the United States. And I think that the the uh, at least the rationale for that is that people as citizens should know how our system actually works, and you know what the Congress does and what the president does and what the what are the the powers of the states versus the federal government and, and things like that. And so, uh, yes, I, ideas uh, that are that are outside the the sort of mainstream ideology of the major parties, uh, to me, would should would, should and 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 sometimes are taught. Uh, but maybe not in the in the context of a civics class more narrowly construed, if you see what I mean. Um, but I'm I'm curious about whether anyone uh, has a response to the. Oh, I don't think we actually read the discussion question. I, I wanted to give Joyce a chance to. Joyce okay, to great. Ask a comment. I would like to invite her to speak. Hi, um, I'm kind of putting my question or my comment together as I go. Um, I am not a history buff. It's very possible that everybody on this call loves history. I hated history um, ever since the fourth grade when my teacher misread my four for a seven and and caused my and said my answer was wrong, even though I know it was right. Anyway, um, so I don't think that necessarily history is 
what the problem is. I think that education in civics, like what the heck is the filibuster? What are we talking about? The 60 and the plurality and the whatever. So I think those parts of education are really important. And for those people who can handle the history, I think that's important as well. I think that the general voting public, we vote emotionally. We vote like, you know, who's wearing the nicer suit? I mean, and it's sad, but I think that that's often very, very true. And so, and especially now with technology and the way things are are passed on to us, whether they be true or not. So I think that there's that whole discussion as well is that when you're trying to compare the old time to the new time, the factors are just all so different. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but there you go. <laughs> I think you're making a lot of sense. And uh, it's funny that you say what you say about history. And if you guys will permit me, I just a recent conversation I had with my daughter, who's 20. And uh, she's never been you know, that into to history. Uh, but just the other day, she asked me a question she asked me, you know, Dad, the Democrats used to be the party of like white supremacy and racism. And the Republicans were the party that, uh, you know, was Abraham Lincoln. And now it seems the opposite. And how did that happen? <laughs> and of course, you know, as a dad, I was so happy that she asked me that question because it's actually something I, I do know about. Uh, but, but yeah, the history uh, sometimes seems like a distraction. Sometimes it seems like an irrelevant. Sometimes it seems like a sort of like antiquarian trivia. Uh, and it, it can be. But then sometimes when it seems very relevant to things happening in the present, you know, we're, we historians are here for you <laughs> to answer questions like that. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I'll also say about my fellow historians, and I was talking about this earlier with Amanda, you know, the, the historians who, who have PhDs are so sometimes unable to think and understand the way the general public sees historical questions that they have a way of presenting them in a very impenetrable way. <laughs> Uh, and and it, it, there's there's something about being trained as an academic historian that almost makes you bad at being able to have conversations like this with the general public, which is which is a shame, and we need to figure out how to do better with that. Did we want to um, did we want to still read question number three or? Um... Did we, did I, we... I would love to read question number three, okay. but if other people have other things they wanted to say, I'd rather go with what people want yeah, to say. If anybody would like to, if anybody has, uh, I'd, we'd love for you to comment or um, in the chat or, or raise your hand or even just unmute your mic to speak and I'll, I, I can call on you if that's what you'd like to do. Anybody at the moment? Um, I, I wanted yeah, I wanted to say something. Uh, okay, I'm kind of being left footed right now with um, things, but um, um, a couple of things. I do like, I hated history in, in, um, in high school because it seemed to be all about, uh, you know, what happened on a certain date. And then when I went to LSU, I had the good fortune to have a, um, history teacher who was a, a, a tremendous storyteller. So he took all, all of these dry or uh, facts and arcane stuff and he, he made it vibrant and about humans and messing up and getting it right. But he made it, he made it to be a story. And that's when I, that's when I fell in love with um, history and, um, uh, I, as a typical New Orleanian, I grew up in Catholicism where we, you know, we think everything came from the Ten Commandments, you know, that uh, the Catholic Church, I think, permeates uh, our, our thought processes so completely. And I went to Catholic school all my life that we, 
we weren't taught to question. We were taught to, to absorb, digest, and obey. And um, so anyway, cut to the chase. Uh, about uh, 20 years ago, I worked, I, well, I was a public relations director at Covenant House, which is a um, yeah. facility on North Rampart Street for, for homeless kids. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the first time in my life that um, I worked about half of our work, I guess we had a, about 60 employees, 60 to 70 employees. And um, it was the first time I'd ever worked with a, with a large black population of employees. It was, my, it was my first time. Every other job I had prior to that had been with um, a white, in, in a white environment. And so I had a lot of discussions I think I would not have had otherwise. And I would say things thinking that I was so smart um, about history or civics or whatever. And my, my coworkers would say, well, that's European history. And I said, what? I said to myself, what? And they would say, well, that's not, you're looking at it from the way that history and civics is written from a white European standpoint. You're not looking at what happened from the perspective of a black person in America. And uh, that, was, that was so jolting, that was so jolting. And it was the first time that, I mean, it, I've never forgotten those exchanges because it, 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 it gave me pause. Uh, to really understand that, you know, the history that children learn, it overwhelmingly it's a bunch of white guys that that put together. I mean, I I lived in Texas, which, which you know, one of their big for seven years I lived in Texas, and one of their big things is um, the uh, approval process for the textbooks. Right. That's, that's a gigantic thing. And when I lived there, there was a lot of a lot of um, debate, debate about um, about what books were, are going to be approved. And I think I think the series was banned in Lafayette, wasn't it? That some of the um, lawmakers are um, still going ahead and doing it, I believe. Yeah. Right? yeah so, so it's it's um, anyway, I wanted to say that, you know, that. You know, I'm a product of my environment, right? <laughs> you know, I'm a, a, I'm a product of my experiences, and and so it was. Um, like I said, it was, it's still jolting to to think that, you know, that I what I've been given is is a a very culturally biased version of the truth. Yeah. And and uh, okay, so set that aside. Then let me current currently current day. Okay, I um. I exercise at, a, at the fitness center at East Jefferson Hospital. It's a, it's a, it's a fitness, it's a, it's a gym that has an older clientele. And there are TV sets all over the place. I think they're like 16 TV sets. So um, about, uh, about six months before the pandemic, the, um, it's a lovely, it's a lovely place. About, but about uh, six months or so before the pandemic, uh, at the front desk, they put out a survey where you could indicate, where you could indicate what um, channels you wanted on all of these 16 TV sets. And so you, you know, they had several choices and then you could fill in if you wanted something that wasn't listed. So, you know, I filled it out and whatever. And anyway, the upshot of that voting the upshot of that democracy is that Fox News did not make the cut. And I was kind of surprised about that, but also look very happy if I can tell you the truth, because I, uh, I think that's just garbage. Anyway, uh, so Fox News was eliminated from these 16 TV sets. And then about um, two weeks later, it was back. So I had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with one of the helpers and I said, well, what, 
what went on? And he's, he told me, he says, oh my God. He says, the Fox people went berserk. They called the CEO of the hospital. They called the president of Jefferson Parish. They raised holy hell. And I said, well, you know, this isn't really democratic, is it? He says, no, not at all. He said, but it's, it's I guess, the bully factor, you yeah. know? And I think that, um, I think that all of these, all of this, I guess, is to lead to what I perceive now is this, the bully factor, right. the, the, the minority militia, the, you know, all of these suppression laws, uh, let's go back to the good old days anyway. I, yeah. I, just remember, because this is the truth. I mean, this is what happened at a public facility owned by East Jefferson, owned by the public, East Jefferson Hospital, that that majority rule did not rule. That the, the, the people with the big mouth, the bullies won the day as opposed, yeah. they had, they had the, the, I don't know, the, the loud mouths, but they didn't have the numbers. Now, you know, I'm not going to go out there and question everything, but anyway, I just, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> I think that it, it, I'm really so struck by the fact that you argued that it was undemocratic though, because y you know, that shows me that there's a, there's a, democratic principle of fairness that you felt was being violated in this situation. And yeah, it's, it's violated all the time in all kinds of ways. Uh, and it's, it's a continuous struggle, but I, I wanted to go back to what you said uh, about being told by someone at Covenant House mm -hmm. uh, that you had a, 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 a blinkered understanding of history or a white understanding of history. And in the, uh, in the comments, uh, Emily, said that you were lucky someone pointed out that blind spot to you, Judy. Right. And, and I think, I, I think, yes. And, but I think it, it also, you know, it took uh, something from you to, to be open to what they were saying uh, and to hear what they were saying and not, and not simply dismiss it, uh, which would have also been easy to do based on, you know, some things from your education. Right. 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 Exactly. It was jolting though. It's still no, jolting, no. and it's it it. I mean, it's also tremendously beneficial because but it gives what, me what that show what that points up is something that that historians also historians also talk a lot about, which is that history. One of the many things that can be done with history is it can be used as a tool of power and even a tool of oppression, uh, and a, a version of history. Uh, can be very anti-democratic and very inegalitarian. And, uh, you know, for example, the way the Civil War and Reconstruction was taught, uh, especially in the South, but not only confined to the South, uh, for many, many years, uh, was really, a, a, I would say, a pillar of white supremacy, you know, that version of history. Uh, well, to that point, let me, to that point, uh, I had a friend, a friend and I used to uh, uh, at least once a year go and visit Natchez, Mississippi, which is a lovely town. And if you take one of the tours of those, those houses, they call the Civil War, the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> That's, they don't, do not call it the Civil War. They call it the War of Northern Aggression. So there you go, the power of words, right? Uh, how we can just with uh, two or three words completely change a conversation. The bad guys were the northerners. It's, it's amazing. I, I wanted to, I saw Keisha, you had your video up. Did you wanna um, comment? Oh, I just wanted to say to um, Judy, I, I applaud you. And I think any person who is open to information and can process it and, you know, take a moment and look at it and say, wait a minute, let me, let me see what I was being taught and let me see how I, you know, what, what that means to me and what that means to you, because that's so true. I'm a native of New Orleans, raised in Catholicism, uh, and we are taught just to, you know, and take this information whichever way we give you and that is how it's going to work 
But I also think as citizens, if you are a true citizen, you want the greater good of all people and that you understand when you talk about the Constitution, we understand the historical aspect of it, how a lot of people, you know, saying this lightly, were not even considered people and how history and politics go hand in hand. The Constitution in a lot of ways. Um, in different points, because we talk about states' rights, how they interpret these laws to work for them is important. So, you know, I have committed myself to lifelong learning, but that is so true. I mean, your reality could be totally different than somebody else's reality. So when we vote, hopefully when we vote, that we, you know, we vote from our perspective, but we also have to consider, like, you know, maybe I was in a place of privilege. Maybe I had a decent life, but not everybody did. So if we're going to change laws to spend money or not spend money, how is that going to affect everyone? And I think sometimes, I, I guess it's just human nature. You want to protect your own interests. I think that's a human thing. Like some people feel like, oh, if I vote, then all, of, you know, it's going to be chaotic and, pan, you know, pandemonium is going to set in. But that's not the truth. If you help others if you help citizens be better citizens and actually get into it and um not just vote about it but be active in your community it can be better for everybody you know um but i was I, that is impressive because sometimes when you argue with people or debate with people they are just so steadfast in what they believe it's like nothing can change that you can show them stats you can show them power charts you can show them you know, history books that maybe they never looked at, and it's like still no nope and not. So, I mean, that, um, you know, that's a testament to her to say that she is so aware now. And I think that when that happened, she probably opened up so many other avenues for her and other people, too. I'm not just saying, Judy, I just thought that that was touching. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But, th but there are consequences from it because, like, um, <sighs> I have a younger sister and um, her husband is, uh, mm, you know, he's what they call an evangelical. He's very racist. Um, they live in, they live north of Atlanta. And when you go visit them, they like to go to Stone Mountain to uh -huh. that, that, uh, that, that chiseled thing with the Confederacy. Thing, you know, I mean, um, um, the, the Civil War is, on, is ongoing because it, it, it pits family members against family members and um, it's tough, it's, 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 it's tough, but I, I will always try to have an open mind. Good for you, Miss Judy. I mean, everybody's different. I think what happens is, and this is where a lot of problems start. I can just, you and I can disagree on something, but that doesn't mean we have to go to the extreme measures. You know, that's just your opinion. I have to respect your opinion. I don't always have to agree with your opinion, but people want you to just see it their way and that's not always the case but I, I mean I get it I get it, it it's a uh, it's a hard call but I, you respect people's opinion understand where they come from and sometimes you just have to you know step away from it you know I think uh can I jump in I I've been really <laughs> Uh, uh, the between Judy and and Keisha, and and uh, I didn't want to, uh, you know, interfere with that. And uh, Keisha, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you'll come to the subsequent sessions as well. And uh, you know, I think uh, the idea of democracy is that there is going to be conflict. It's not democracy doesn't mean an absence of conflict, right? It it means that we need to have some structure by which these conflicts can play out fairly and, and peacefully and not nonviolently. Uh, so for example, we need uh, fairness in our arrangements 
of who gets to vote as I valiantly try to steer us back to our <laughs> discussion topic. Uh, uh, but you know, the whole idea of, of, of liberal democracy is based on the fact that yes, we have a very diverse society. There are many viewpoints. People don't agree with each other all the time and, and that's okay. You know, diversity can, can present problems but it, it also can be a good thing. Uh, and, but, but so that just highlights the need for the, the structures under the, the sort of structure in which we disagree uh, to be, to be healthy and, and functioning. Uh. Yeah, I know we have about 15 more minutes today, um, but uh, I, I just wanted to say that, yes, like I, this, this all from everything that like Keisha and Judy just said, the idea of voting versus patronage came up to me, um, especially when you mentioned the Fox News voting. It was interesting. Well, well, that obviously, you know, the fitness center isn't a true democracy, but they did try to offer that to um, their patrons and they voted a certain way. And then specific elements used outsized power and tools to get the vote changed <laughs> or to essentially throw out the vote. And it was a very interesting microcosm, the idea of voting versus patronage and how patronage can play an outsized role in government decisions in a society where voting isn't just a right uh, of every citizen. That's really, and I, I found that interesting personally, is just uh, perhaps in our society, um, those who control the message, those who have access to politicians, benefit from yeah benefit from uh not everybody being allowed to vote right i see rel raising her hand uh in response to what you were just saying amanda oh yeah i just wanted to give a quick example from a library that i used to work at uh and uh it, it was very much like the fitness center in fact the people were supposed to treat everyone the same and uh and yet the people that were the biggest assholes were given the most like consideration and the most um accommodations kind of for being huge assholes and it kind of rewarded their behavior and i just wanted to say that like you know that happens in the library world too i, I think I've, I've seen that one that's all it's called the trump factor <laughs> I guess we can we can we can read discussion question three since we didn't get to it. <laughs> if you wanted to, Lou. Yeah. Okay. But well, I, to everything. I will. I will read discussion question number three. Uh, so, and it, I think it relates to things that we've been talking about. United States history is sometimes taught, especially to school-age children, as an optimistic narrative of progress, in which democracy is gradually expanded in an episodic way as different groups, first unpropertied white men, then African-American men, then women, then 18 to 21 year olds attained the right to vote. Lichtman argues in his introduction that quote, the advancement of voting rights has not by any means followed a straight line of continuous enfranchisement. So I'm just wondering if you, if this optimistic narrative is what you were presented with in school. For me, it was, it's a, and I would characterize it as a very liberal viewpoint. You know, the idea that, oh yes, we've had these injustices in our past, but look at how they've gradually been solved one by one and things are getting better and better all the time. And the moral arc of the universe is always bending towards justice. Uh, so so was, was that a, a view of American history that you were presented with in school? And, does the book require us to rethink it or did did you do we just throw that out completely or and this is the heart of it to me is there some civic benefit to the more optimistic view of progress in other words even though there are so many acknowledged flaws to democracy does it help us in some way to retain a, a, an idealistic view of democracy uh, are there costs in sticking to a celebratory narrative? 
uh, or might American democracy and American citizens be better served by a more skeptical or critical view? And the suspense is over. That was question number three. I saw Joyce had her hand raised, but she took it down. Are you good, Joyce? Or did you? Well, I'll just make one quick comment. It's not necessarily about question number three, but um, you you use the term allowed to vote, and we talk about enfranchisement and disenfranchisement. Um, when I was doing some voter registrations, um, we were in. Um, I, I happened to have like a 30 minute conversation with a black gentleman who absolutely positively refuses to register to vote. And he's just one of hundreds of thousands, I suspect, who don't even want to register to vote because they don't believe that their vote is going to make a difference. I mean, everything that happened with the last election and all, you know, so here we are talking about getting people to register and getting people to show up but people don't feel like their vote is going to, to translate into the things that we, we all need individually or as a community. So um, that, I mean, I tried and tried and tried to say, yeah, but if you don't vote, and he said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anyway. I, I think that's um, really interesting because I think we have to talk about uh, well, I mean, you know, what this entire conversation will hopefully lead us to is to examine, yeah, like the, I think that plays exactly into what um, we talked about in that the optimism, the optimism that things have been progressive. Clearly, for some people, that optimism that that is a lie things have not been progressive things have not been easy and people have maybe been disenfranchised for so long for decades for centuries that proving to people that even if they did vote it would matter is is a very very high bar to clear you know just because i you know i it, and it also it hurts in every election when you vote one way or especially in you know um when you live in a state that's quite polarized where there is a large majority that is of the side that is not yours to to be convinced that somehow your vote will ever count um that that's that's interesting and i think that relates back to what we were just saying like the the optimistic view of progress. Progress has never been made evident to entire segments of our population, no matter what a couple of sentences in a history book may, may um, try to project. Sure. I think the, the flip side is that cynicism can also be the enemy. Yes. Right. If people are hopeless, if they, as the person that, uh, uh, Joyce talked to believe completely that their vote has no meaning, uh, then they are essentially disenfranchising themselves. Uh, and so I think there is a lot of cynicism about the idea of democracy. Uh, and, you know, I think for me, actually, the Trump years for many people brought back maybe a, a little bit of the idea that actually democracy with all its imperfections is something that we really need and, and want to hold on to. Uh, but it's, it's by no means a universal agreement about it. Uh, and it I, also I, occurs to me that the biggest country, the largest country in the world is China, uh, which you know does not have any, there is no voting in China, right? <laughs> It's a one one party system. So uh, if you if you look at this globally, uh, democracy is is still a very a minority and embattled idea. Um, I see that Rel and Emily have their hands raised. Um, do do I do you mind if I defer to Emily first, Rel, um, since she's comment she's uh, uh, said less. I hope that's okay. Well, I'd like to defer to Keisha if Keisha wants to go first, because um, the comment in the chat was something that I was going to um, reference. But if Keisha has something that they, you know, she'd like to say, I, I'd defer to her. Oh, oh no, not at all. I, I, sometimes I tend to ramble. I, I, the, the, <laughs> the chat is fine. Please take the floor. <laughs> 
you're preaching to the choir with the rambling. Um, and, and this is, I'm just going to give like a little trigger warning or whatever, but something that I, that has been kind of on my head, my mind a lot lately talking to, um, talking to black coworkers and black friends and neighbors about the vaccine and that kind of thing is you, you absolutely can't dismiss any of their hesitations because they are definitely based in truth. Um, you know, like as Keisha says in the comments that, um, you know, even with, since they've been uh, officially franchised to vote, you know, especially in the South, there would be, you know, white uh, citizens showing up at the polls in order to threaten or perform violence on Black voters. Um, and then we also live in Louisiana where, you know, like as a, as a liberal, as a Democrat, um, I've been told and shown over and over and over again that my vote's going to get erased basically in the results because there's not enough of us. So we've seen gerrymandering and all of that. And so when I said earlier in the, in the chat that <clears throat> I don't think that optimism is balanced, what I mean is, is that we, we cannot discuss our history or our future with blind optimism. It has to be balanced with facts um, and the, and that and that experiences are very different. Like I just was too busy to vote a lot of times in like local elections, but um, I'm trying to remember who it was that that said that they were having trouble convincing um, somebody to register to vote. <clears throat> Depending on his age, he may have been, you know, a child watching his father get threatened with violence whenever he tried to show up at a poll, you know, so I think that the reason why Stacey Abrams and, and the other activists in Georgia were so effective was because they they were there organizing for years before the, the pivotal election where their work was so crucial. Um, and so they showed up and they were they were known to the community and they got results. And so um, for every result that they got, every little win, even some of the losses that happened, I think prove to people that they were there, they were there for the long haul and they were doing the work so that like, yes, like, you know, you have to say, yes, your vote has not counted. Unfortunately, that that's been the, the true and accurate history of our country, but I'm going to do everything in my power to make it count. Now, if you'll trust me and work with me, let's get you registered to vote so we can get all of our votes counted, you know, that kind of thing, but you have to acknowledge the very real emotional and just factual truth that they're living. I, I want to just respond to Emily, both with what you just said and what, with your comment in the chat that I'm trying to squat. Yeah. You don't, I don't think that optimism is balanced. Yeah. I think that excessive optimism can definitely uh, be a, a, a form of denial or blinkeredness uh, or refusal to, to face what is really happening. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, a complete lack of optimism or a lack of hope can also be very disempowering. So I think there's a very fine line, you know, if we want to keep striving uh, to, to make things better or make things more democratic, we need to retain some sort of optimism, some, some sort of conviction that, that things uh, can get better. And, yeah, I, I wanted to step in and say we only we only have a couple more minutes with Low, but I do I, I do promise y'all um, everybody who has their hands raised we will um, get to your comments as well. Uh, Low may step out in a couple minutes here, but we can continue the discussion for a little bit longer, no problem. I, I can stay a little bit longer. I'm I'm, I'm okay. having so much fun, and I feel like we've I only know. been here for about three minutes. I, I like I feel like we just got started. Uh, uh, could, could, could I say something to the issue of, of, um, of optimism? I wanted to share another experience that I have. Uh, I'm active with the League of Women Voters and they do a lot of collaborations with uh, the Jeremiah Project. And um, anyway, we did a lot of um, uh, voter registrations in high schools. And um, one of them, one memorable, memorable me experience was that Bonneville High School. Bonneville, you know, the Bonneville was a slave owner. Um, and there are some efforts to rename Bonneville, Bonneville High School. Yeah. And it's a school that has a lot of gang problems. Lusher too. Oh, 
trying to rename Lusher. Okay. And so anyway, we, we're, we're registering the kids in the library and we got to do this very quickly because it's in between classes. And I was registering this young man and it, it was so poignant. Um, the first day that you can register is when you are 17 and he came to register on his 17th birthday. Well, so he was registering the very earliest that someone could register. So whenever you feel down and out, I would like for you to remember this young man at Bonneville High School, uh, registering on the very first day that he could, uh, going to school in a gang infested high school, you know, it just, it's dear. It's dear and we have, it's a Valentine. It's a, I consider that a Valentine to democracy. So I hope you will too and not forget him. Judy, thank you so much for the work that you, you've done for that volunteer work. That's really great. You're welcome. Oh, oh, let's have a uh, comment really quick. And then I wanted to invite uh, Jim slash Celine. And then we have a couple of comments in chat too. Uh, I just wanted to respond to the discussion question and Joyce and Emily and everyone and say I feel like the concept we're all we were all circling around or was dual power structures that's the answer to that like uh, the, the, the you say yeah your vote might not count that's kind of why you have to do it because you got to build both or it ain't gonna <laughs> it ain't gonna work uh you have to build the thing that you want while uh, you, you have to try on both fronts. And uh, that was what I just wanted to say about that. The end. And I wanted to invite uh, uh, Celine and or Jim. Uh, this is Jim again. Uh, I wanted to A, respond to the question, which is I was taught the optimistic view that uh, the arc went better, but it was on a grand scale. Decades could go where it went up and then down. Um, it never went down below where it started, but it may backslide. And certainly that anything, if you look at from 1890 to 1930 was a serious backslide period. Uh, probably even back to 1870 to 1930 was a backslide. Uh, and certainly uh, was uh, a problem on the on the optimism side, one of the things I've lived in both Massachusetts and Louisiana, and I vote because in both those states, I'm I vote Democratic. Uh, both those states, I could I could justify it by saying my votes thrown out. Massachusetts is not going to vote Republican in the Louisiana sense of the term, current term, uh, and in Louisiana, I'm not going to get. You know, Trump, uh, I'm not going to get Biden as being the presidential nominee out of Louisiana. So I could, in theory, say my votes wasted in both those states. Uh, but when I look at the national number in the last election, that tells me I need to vote. The fact that Biden's popular vote was so large, it was because there were a lot of places like Louisiana. My sister lives in Wyoming. I know what she voted in, Louis in Wyoming, and it was canceled out 10 times worse than mine in Louisiana. Um, but over the course of the country, it added up and it gave a talking point, it gave a power, it gave uh, force to Biden's success, in my opinion. And if we don't vote, uh, we're just basically conceding the issue, uh, even if we don't on a very narrow and uh, sort of personal standpoint succeed. The other part that I wanted to say was the feeling that something won't work to me is, is I go back to, I think it's Kantian philosophy about somebody mentioned Roman Catholic uh, beliefs that said, you should believe in God. Why? Because there's no downside to it. If you believe in God and there is a God, then you're saved at the end of, the, end of the, at the end of your life. If there's no God, you haven't really lost anything. So go ahead and believe in God. 
it's it's somewhat flipped, but I believe the same thing with voting. It it doesn't cost me anything to do it. Now, that's different from being uh, abused at a polling place or beaten up or something like that. I'm not talking about that kind of fear of voting, but a fear of voting just because your vote's going to be wasted. It's it's not that much of an investment, and the return is huge if it's if it's real and the cost is minimal. So that's part of what drives my optimism to continue to vote. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Who do we have who we still haven't heard from, Amanda? Um, actually, I think everybody said, but I know that uh, Keisha has has commented in chat that like, uh, you know, her grandmother was 42 when she was allowed to register and her grandfather was 44 um, as mm. African Americans. It, it, it's mind boggling. We, we have to like, you know, the arc is both long and short. There's lived memory today of people not being allowed to vote. And even after they allegedly got the right to vote, people still trying to stop them. Right. But, um, and, uh, Let's see here. And then also, um, she also expressed that uh, her uh, family, um, you know, they never miss once they got that right, they never miss one election. And she didn't get to vote. She didn't get it until she was older, but she's very proud of them. Um, and they also brought brought her to vote because you're going to have to do this one day. And that's, that's important. I, I would say um, modeling is very interesting and we can't expect everybody to have been in a situation to model for their kids because of various factors of, you know, like their, their life experience, et cetera. But, but I would say I, I maybe learned to vote from modeling from, from having um, my parents have political discussions in the houses and bringing me when they went to vote. Um, it's, it's, it's very important, even if you don't do it like right away. Um, I also wanted to, uh, oh gosh, there was something, I apologize. I've totally lost the thought, but there was something that Jim had said that, I wanted to respond to, but now I forgot. <laughs> so, um, is anybody? Um, was it about what you were taught in uh, in high school uh, about in civics and how the arc of history bends towards? Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that. Um, I, if I think of it before we we uh, end today, I will uh, put it in there. Um, I do know that I did note that. Um, in chat, um, you're, you're welcome to share your emails with each other if you want to in chat. You know, the chat is not going to be part of the recording that we post on YouTube, so don't worry about that. It will only be amongst yourselves. Uh, I just wanted to say, Amanda, that, you know, going back to the discussion about voting and, and how sometimes people can feel like their vote is wasted or their vote is meaningless, I think that... It, I. I think that merely voting, if voting, is, you know, once a year, or maybe once or twice a year is your only form of political engagement, then that is a very minimalist and passive mm -hmm. uh, uh, approach to political engagement, right? And I think everyone here who's in this chat, who's taken the time on a Saturday morning to be a part of this discussion hosted by a public library uh, is has already gone significantly beyond, uh, y you know, the sort of passive democracy approach of merely casting a vote. And and I think casting a vote is very important, but uh, there are so many other ways of being engaged. Uh, so, y you know, vote. I think voting has to be seen as just one one component of of citizen engagement. And I think we'll really talk about that next time. And this is a great segue there. We'll really talk about that next time with Martha Jones's book, Vanguard. And I really hope everyone will check the book out. It's a tremendous book. Uh, it, it's, there's so much good stuff in there. Uh, and it's, a, it's really a, a very inspiring book uh, in many ways uh, about the history of uh, African-American women's uh, participation in politics and politics construed in many different ways, not just voting, uh, but but civic engagement more broadly. Uh, and I also want to say uh, 
to uh, Mary Hall, Sally, Sunor, Ashley, and others who have not uh, joined the discussion. Of course, we're happy to, to have you here uh, simply watching, but I certainly encourage you to come next time and, uh, and join in. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from, from you and to hear from everybody again who, is, who has uh, spoken up this session. I, I was going to say, I still have a couple copies of Vanguard for free to keep if you want to fill out the uh, book survey. Let me, um, so I wanted to say before we, um, you know, really clear up today, I have just dropped the link to the Louisiana Endowment for Humanities survey. They would like everybody who participates to fill it out. It doesn't matter if you've read the book or not. I know the questions will pertain to the book, but don't worry about it. Some of it will present pertain to the discussion that we had here today, and that's what it's important to answer. Um, that's that little link that I just dropped in chat. So if you all could today, as soon as uh, we're done here, if you could fill that out. And then um, I also want to say, um, let me drop in the program hub page. That's uh, where I've got links to the discussion guides. And once these videos are complete, we're going to upload links to the YouTube videos there. It'll, it, it, that's something I'm going to be work on, working on at like a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, behind uh, uh, as we air. But let me um, get the link to our hub page real quick for the program. And uh, you can share this with anybody you think would like to come to the future programs. I think we're gonna have a robust discussion next time. A lot of people have requested Vanguard. And also um, I wanted to uh, add that in is uh, uh, Martha Jones, the author, uh, if y'all are not familiar with the situation, and I'm not, a, I, I'm not going to editorialize this, I'm just going to state what happened, which is this program was supposed to occur at the Lafayette Public Library. The librarians there uh, did sign up for it, and they were going to prevent, present Vanguard in another book that we're not covering about the Voting Rights Act. And um, their politically appointed Library Board of Control, which are generally uh, appointees, uh, uh, appointed by their uh, mayor president, um, shut the program down um, for quote unquote, it not um, discussing both sides of the issue, which, um, you know, I, like I said, I'm not going to editorialize that statement. And uh, it, the program did, um, the library board of control canceled at the library. So the university, um, of Louisiana at Lafayette stepped in and is now going to be hosting the program for them. So, so luckily it didn't, you know, it, it luckily the, the arc of justice did, did complete a little bit there, but Martha Jones, the author of Vanguard wrote an editorial about it in the Washington post. So those are the last two links I'm going to get here in chat real Great. Quick for y'all. Let me get those in there. So here is our hub page that I am dropping in chat right now. This is where um, all the uh, like the book request form, the Zoom sign up, and the discussion guides are. Which please share those as far as wide as you want. And even when we run out of books, there are books in the collection people can request. And um, here is the Martha uh, Jones. Um, uh, editorial um, in preparation for next week. Sorry, I'm doing my librarian Google fruit foo. But um, her article was called, or her um, editorial was called Black History is Often Shunned Like the Book I Wrote, which is just, so it's, uh, one of the things that I noted in the discussion guide for this title and even in the title itself is that it's amazing how the same discussions seem to keep happening again and again. <laughs> And uh, her editorial, I think, very much speaks to that. So I highly recommend it. That's, That's great. Me. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right. Well, tell, you, tell, tell your friends. Uh, <laughs> you know, ev everyone come back uh, a week from today, next Saturday, and uh, bring one or two uh, friends along with you. Please do. Um, we'll have a robust discussion. I'll do my best to moderate. We'll probably last a little longer because I know it, uh, we're probably going to have a bigger group too. But um, 
I wanted to thank everybody for coming today and sharing. This was this was really wonderful to um, to really just this is us saying it on the ground, and that was the purpose of the program was for us to be able to just come as as regular citizens and really talk about what sometimes seems rarefied and impenetrable, which is like, you know, and that stems from like, does my vote even count or politicians are gonna politician, you know, but I think this is important conversations like this is, you know, it's good for us to come and realize that we are elements of our own government. Each and every one of us is a participant in our own government and we should fight for everybody to get that participation right by default. It shouldn't be something you have to earn. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't have to be something you need to fight for. Voting should be a right. I know that's not, nobody's, nobody's claiming that's the message of this program, but that's really what I feel. <laughs> and um, yeah, again, thank you all. Thank you all for coming today and sharing. This was really great. It was good to see y'all. And thank you so much, Lo, for facilitating. Oh, Thanks. thank you so much, Amanda. I'm I'm so psyched for uh, for the next sessions. Yeah. Well, with that said, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign it off for everybody now. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing y'all next weekend. Okie doke. So long, everybody. Enjoy thank your you. day. Stay safe. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Bye. Goodbye, y'all.